Hello, my beautiful friends. My name is Kim, and I hope you're having a fabulous day today. If you are interested in true crime like I am, I hope that you would consider hitting that subscribe button. But either way, you know what? Thanks for being here. For over two decades, starting in 1970, four women disappeared along this same road in rural Oregon, Highway 20. The location was not the only thing that connected Kay Turner, Rashonda Pickle, Melissa Saunders, and Sheila Swanson. All of them were also last seen alive by the same man. Let's talk about John Arthur Aykroyd, the monster of Highway 20. Almost 45 years later, and the only survivor of John Arthur Aykroyd still feels like the deaths of the four women could have been prevented if her story had been taken seriously. It all begins in June 1977. Back then, 20-year-old Marlene lived in the small city of Lebanon along Highway 20 together with her husband and her young baby girl. The fresh parents absolutely adored their child but was looking forward to a night out in Sisters. Sisters is a town. 80 miles away to have some alone time as a couple. And so Marlene and her husband left the baby under the care of a friend and headed to Sister's Rodeo, which to this day is always held on the second weekend of June. At first, everything was going great, but as the night wore on, Marlene became somewhat intoxicated, and there was an argument between her and her husband. The situation escalated so badly that in the end, Marlene, all angry and frustrated, decided to leave her husband behind and find her own way home. She's like, screw you, I'm out of here, Bye bye But what's crazy is that years later, Marlene commented on the situation saying, I was underage, I shouldn't have been drinking, and I got angry about something. Now, I can't even remember. It's so stupid that I just walked off. Hitchhiking and taking a ride from a stranger is much less common nowadays than in the 1970s when the practice was in peak popularity. While hitchhiking is seen today as a risky means of transportation, back then it was often just a practical and in many cases a free way to get from one place to another. And that is exactly what Marlene thought that evening. She was asking around for a ride and finally one stranger said that he would drive the young woman all the way back to her home in Lebanon. Marlene remembers she was grateful for the offer, not thinking twice about it. She just wanted to get back home to her small baby. Marlene noted that the man's car was a beat up old pickup truck, but did not pay attention to the interior at first. I thought there was nothing wrong. I'd be safe. It wasn't that far from home. I didn't even look around inside the vehicle. All I knew it was just a beat up old truck and I was going home to my kid. The two then headed west and after some time, Marlene noticed that the truck door did not have a cover on the inside and no handle, so there was no way for her to open it. Still, Marlene thought nothing of it and quickly fell asleep. When she opened her eyes later, Marlene was in the middle of a nightmare. Now her head was on the seat of the car banging it and the truck door was open outside the man who had been so friendly before to offer her a ride now yanked her by her ankles and grabbed her by her neck. He then lifted Marlene up from her hair and threw her on the ground before picking up a buck knife from a coffee can. The stranger placed the knife on Marlene's throat, telling her she needed to do everything he asked. Needless to say, Marlene quickly agreed, fearing for her life. Now to this day, Marlene remembers how beautiful this place was where this stranger had taken her. With green trees and blooming tiny flowers, the first thing she was thinking was, quote, how can you be hurt? in this kind of beauty, unquote. The driver of the truck proceeded to pull down Marlene's pants without even losing her belt. 
He then cut Marlene's boots with the knife and raped her. When the man was finally done and was gathering Marlene's clothes, she was thinking the question she feared to hear the answer for. What was his plan? As this man said, now what am I going to do with you? Marlene begged the man to take her home, scared she would be left in the woods alone or be killed. She spoke in a low voice as sweet as she could, and to her relief, the stranger, he agreed. He gave Marlene a pair of old torn pants, and then the two once again began driving to Lebanon. On the way, Marlene noticed a rifle in the truck and was afraid to say anything that would cause this man to use it. Most of the time, she kept quiet, but at one point, the man asked an unbelievable question. And he asked me if I'd be his girlfriend. Well, I look down and I see that coffee can with the knife in it. I said, yes. How delusional do you have to be to assault a woman and then ask her to be your girlfriend? It's so, so bizarre. But that is the mind of Ackroyd. After a journey that must have felt like an eternity, the man finally dropped Marlene off at her mother-in-law's house. When she pounded on the door, the truck sped away and he was gone. After all she had gone through, Marlene could have just broken down and gone to have a bath as her mother-in-law suggested. Her mother-in-law is like, go get in the shower. But she knew she could not wash this man off of her. That was the evidence that she needed. Instead, she went to the hospital and had a kit done. Then Marlene was able to have a shower before heading to the police station to report what had happened. But unfortunately, she did not get the help she desperately needed. Despite all the evidence, abrasions on her back, on her thighs and her legs, vaginal swelling and bruising from her jeans and her underwear that had been that been ripped off in her slash boots, the police still did not believe Marlene's story. It is a different time now. This was 1970, and you know these some of these cases just were not taken serious, and that is exactly what happened in Marlene's case. They even made her take a polygraph test and interviewed her numerous times to focus on any inconsistencies in her story. In the end the police concluded that Marlene was lying and did not pursue the case any further on Ackroyd, which is just devastating. The people Marlene always thought were meant to protect her turned their back on her. As she said, quote, they made me feel like a smelly drunken native. Unquote. And more importantly, Marlene feels like if they had just listened to her, maybe everything else that came afterward would have never happened. Marlene could have been Ackroyd's only victim. Now she is the only survivor. They were supposed to put this man somewhere where he could not hurt anyone else. Look what happens. Look what happens. I hear I'm the only freaking survivor. One and a half years later, don't know what happened in between this year and a half. If something happened or if something didn't happen, I, it was a cool down period. We don't know. So one and a half years after Marlene's assault, another crime occurred. In 1978, Kay Turner was a 35-year-old manager at Lane County Community Health and Social Services Department. She lived with her husband, Noel, in Eugene, Oregon. Since the mid-1970s, Kay had begun running pretty much every day. And in September of 1978, she t participated in a marathon Literally nothing stopped her from running, not even cold weather. 
she was committed. In December 1978, Kay, Noel, and a few other friends headed to Camp Sherman on the Mescalas River outside of Sisters for a Christmas vacation. On the 23rd, Kay spoke with Sam Nubson and his wife, asking if they would like to join her for her morning run the following day. The wife promised to think about it. She just didn't want to commit, even though she knew she could not keep up with Kay's speed. So she was kind of hesitant, so she didn't really commit. On the morning of December 24th, Christmas Eve, the wife decided she was not going to go for a run after all. And so Kay headed out by herself around 8.15 a.m. Like I said, nothing's going to stop her. Cold, rain, somebody joining me, somebody not. She's going on a run. She told her husband she would be back in an hour or so. Time passed, first an hour and then another hour, but Kay was still not back at the camp. While Kay was able to run for long distances, she should have been back by now, the husband thought. Getting increasingly worried, Noel and the friends of the couple headed out to search for Kay. There was just one big problem. Nobody knew which route Kay had taken. Still, they searched for a very, very long time. But as they were unable to locate Kay, Noel eventually contacted the police and reported her missing. Detective Clay Durr of the Oregon State Police received a call from the Salem Patrol Office. He was informed about a jogger who, was, who had gone missing. Detective Durr, together with Lieutenant Vitetto and Bob Cooley, made their way to the camp to investigate. They began to interview all the people present, trying to figure out who had been the last person to see Kay before she went out on a run. Soon enough, they talked with some high school students who said there had been a person who saw Kay after they did, a man named John Aykroyd. Who is John Arthur Aykroyd? Well, John grew up in a small lodging town of Sweet Home, Oregon. Together with his older and younger sisters, John's father was a maintenance man and his mother worked as an office worker at the police department. Little is known what kind of person John was during his childhood, but we do know that he had a hard time at school. He was a special education student, earning low grades, a loner, and often bullied. John was accused of felony theft as a teen, and not long after that, he enlisted in the army and was stationed in Korea, Thailand, and Germany. John's problems seemed to follow him wherever he went. As he was investigated for selling marijuana and going AWOL overseas, he was also caught trying to steal equipment and supplies. Then, of course, there was the incidents that clearly indicated something was not quite right in John's mind since a young age. He hurt animals. One acquaintance later told the police how he once witnessed John hacking up puppies using a machete. He would also drive back roads and shoot squirrels before cutting off their tails. This kind of behavior is one of the biggest red flags there is. Cruelty against animals is one of the traits from the McDonald triad that is used to identify serial killers and people with violent tendencies. But in many cases, it goes unnoticed or it is not seriously addressed. After the Army, John got a job in the State Highway Department along Route 20 that ran east to west across to Oregon. Apparently, he gained mostly positive feedback, although John's supervisor noted him being lazy sometimes and taking time off frequently. Nevertheless, John's job meant that he had to drive for hours and hours along Highway 20, learning every mile of it every turn and dirt spurs that led into the forest, like the one where the stranger had taken Marlene Gabrielson. 
And now, one and a half years later, 29-year-old John Aykroyd was present in a location where another woman had gone missing. After hearing John Aykroyd's name for the first time, detectives continued speaking with people in the camp. Eventually, they came across Tom Hanna, John's colleague. According to him, they had gotten off work at the same time as John. When Tom had headed to the store, he had seen John's truck parked across the area where Kay had been running. Still, for one reason or another, the investigators did not seem to think John had anything to do with Kay's disappearance. Instead, they even thought that Kay had simply skipped town, left on her own, left her husband, left her friends on Christmas Eve. Meanwhile, Kay's family and friends, who knew without a doubt that she would never, never had left without telling anyone, they kept looking for her. The search continued into January, but there were no signs of Kay. However, they did find a possible point of abduction. There in the mud was prints of a Nike shoe next to a heavier boot print, possibly belonging to a man. In addition, there were signs of a struggle in the area, but no other evidence that would have pointed investigators to the right direction. They were still lost. One reason that John Ackroy did not interest the police much at the time was the fact that they had found out Kay had been on vacation with two different boyfriends weeks before her disappearance. Both of these men were married, so now the police had five potential suspects, Kay's husband, the boyfriends, and the boyfriend's wives. John Aykroyd was not interviewed until January 11th, not as a suspect, but as a person of interest. He admitted seeing Kay running that morning on December 24th, but he said he had nothing to do with her disappearance. And the investigators, they believed him because they were convinced that Noel, the husband, was the one responsible for his wife vanishing from the face of the earth. Of course, it had to be the jealous husband. The only thing is, is that Noel never knew anything about Kay's extramarital affairs. As there were no clues, no body, no witnesses, the case quickly went cold. Months passed without any progression, but then the case was wide open again after a very suspicious development. Eight months after Kay headed out for a run and disappeared, John Aykroyd walked into Camp Sherman's store and told the shopkeeper he had just found the remains of a missing woman. Detective Dirk quickly arrived on the scene to question John and his discovery. According to John, he found a pair of torn yellow jogging shorts and a pile of bones. He also mentioned an awful stench. At this point, Detective Burr began to think something was not right. He felt like John knew more about what had happened to Kay than he had told him earlier. Nevertheless, investigators found their way to the spot where John said Kay's remains were. They found it a little odd that John, who was a seasoned hunter, had even paid attention to scraps of clothing. In addition, the bones were clean, no flesh whatsoever, meaning there is no kind of stench emanating from this area where John discovered these remains. Continuing the search at the scene, the following day, investigators found a watch, a lower jawbone, and some hair in a bird's nest. Due to all the questionable details, John Aykroyd was no more just a person of interest, but a suspect in the case. He's not the only person that found the remains, but also the last person who saw Kay alive. On August 17, 1979, John was asked to take a polygraph test, which he failed. We, I mean, you can only put so much on polygraphs, but we must note that he failed. Bob Cooley then interviewed him again. John just kept denying he had killed Kay, only admitting to seeing her that morning. However, when Bob asked John, the investigator, why he failed the question, quote, did you touch her, unquote, 
he revealed something shocking. John stated that he actually found Kay's body a lot sooner, a lot earlier, back in February, just two months after she went missing. He described what he had seen in detail, saying the body had no eyes, it had been scavenged by animals, and had a slashed throat. In addition, there was what looked like exit wounds of a bullet on Kay's chest. John also claimed that the only reason why he did not report the findings right away was that he was afraid he would be blamed for Kay's death. So instead of ending the suffering of this missing woman's family who did not know where their loved one was, John only cared about himself. But it makes more sense later. Of course, the real truth most likely was that John had always known where Kay's remains were. At this point, the police were convinced he was the one who killed her, but due to the lack of concrete evidence, they had to let him go. And so John Aykroyd was able to continue his life. In 1985, he married Linda, a mother of two. Linda had never had much money, and as a single mother, she struggled to support her children. In turn, John had a stable job, a nice salary, and was able to provide for this family in a way that she couldn't. For Linda, he was a savior. Still, those close to the family knew that John, even though he acted calm and was collected and rarely angry to people who knew him, was always irritable and prone to lash out at the home. John was violent towards the children. Linda's 14-year-old son, Brian, was seen more than once with a black eye, and the 13-year-old Rashonda once had a patch of her hair pulled out from her scalp. In addition, Rashonda's whole personality started to change as soon as the family began living with John. All of the sudden, she was sadder and sadder and afraid to go home. Their classmates, Brian and Rashonda's classmates, began suspecting something terrible was going on in the Ackroyd household. I mean, I remember him uh, spanking her over one of those old school wind-up alarm clocks, and it got broke. That beating she got was over, over the top. It was scary. My mom was yelling at John to, to stop. There would be times way, and this was way before she came out missing, there would be times that his eyes would change color and he says, I want to kill someone. And I would holler at him and say, John, you're scaring me. The signs were clear. Rashonda started cutting herself and she seemed depressed and was tired all the time. Eventually, she began to sneak out from the home for the night, sleeping in her friend Michelle and Mandy's bedroom. Rashonda told the sisters that John came to her room often in the evening time at night. Even though the teen did not say those exact words, Michelle and Mandy knew the man supposed to act as a father was doing to their friend. After all, they were experiencing the same thing in their home. By the summer of 1990, Brian and Rashonda begged their mother to let them go stay with their father, Stephen Pickle. Linda finally broke down and she agreed, and so the siblings traveled to Medford. Soon after their arrival, Stephen sat his kids down and asked about the rumors Rashonda had been sexually assaulted by several different people. The father of the teen said that he would get a lawyer and sue for custody as everything had happened under Linda's watch. Stephen might have meant well, but then a few days after the conversation, he became angry as the children wanted to join a game of hide-and-seek. To Stephen, the game was just an excuse for the kids to have intercourse. As a result, Rashonda demanded to go back home to her mother. That decision would cost Rashonda her life. On the morning of July 10, 1990, Rashonda was awake early to help her mother braid her hair. Afterward, the teen sat 
on the couch to watch cartoons in her pajamas. John and Linda left for work at around 8.30 a.m. and were not expected to be back until afternoon. John was later seen by some of his colleagues on the highway carrying his camera. He said he was going into the woods to get pictures of deer. Later in the afternoon, he picked Linda up from Back Butt Ranch, where she worked as a housekeeper. On their way, John suddenly told his wife that he had been back home that day around 12, but he had not found or seen Rashonda anywhere in the house. When they arrived at the house, the teen still was not there. Linda proceeded to make dinner and finish some chores, thinking that her daughter would appear at any minute. But by 5 p.m. and still no sign of Rashonda, Linda began to worry. I think it was around 10 to 5. I said, something's not right, John. I said, she should have been home. Where is she? You... And then he'd come back and tell me, well, I don't know. I said, well, obviously you should know you were here with her. She then called Brian, the brother, who said he had not heard from his sister either and urged his mother to call the police. However, however, (sighs) Linda did not contact authorities until the next day, simply because John had told her that the police would not do anything until 24 hours have passed. Which, of course, is not true, but in 1970, the police, or no, this was 1990. So in 1990, I mean, yeah, they were still kind of saying you have to wait 24 hours. But of course, we know that's not true today. But Linda's not aware of this. She's believing what John is telling her, which, of course, is not true. And the police would ask her why she had not informed them about the situation earlier. Adults have the right to disappear, but of course, children do not. And the law enforcement does not necessarily use as most effort to find them if it is known that they are not in immediate danger. However, every minute matters when it comes to children, and there is no waiting period to report them missing. The following day, more than 100 officers were looking for Rashonda. 100 searchers from six different county law enforcement agencies, including Lane County, spent their day poking through the wilderness near the Hoodoo Ski Area in search of 13-year-old Rashonda Leah Pickle. In the initial days, air searches of the mostly barren lava lands resulted in nothing. Now, ground crews are concentrating on the heavy underbrush that lines the roadways. They interviewed everyone in the area that knew the family or could have seen or heard anything. Very quickly, the investigators got the feeling that John had something to do with the teen's disappearance. Linda told the officers that she had noticed a strange detail the day her daughter disappeared. The detail was John, who had not initiated sex with her for a while, suddenly behaved very sexually, and the two had sex after eating dinner that day while waiting for Rashonda to return home. They're having sex. Other than that, the police had very little to go on. The searches for Rashonda continued for days and for weeks. The investigators asked John purposely to join the search. They wanted to see if he would unintentionally reveal a a piece of information that would lead them to the missing girl. The investigators also asked what John thought had happened to Rashonda, and he had a rather curious answer. John said that perhaps her body was hidden under a log. That's very specific. Maybe she had been threatened with a knife, tied up and gagged, and her body rolled in plastic. He would say, quote, Somebody could have just come in, knocked her on her head, thrown her over their shoulders, and just walked out with an, without anyone seeing her. Maybe they just walked in, seen an opportunity, and grabbed it. John definitely did not act like a distressed parent whose stepdaughter was missing, possibly dead. In addition, John seemed to remember things like Rashonda's bra size and her weight, but could not remember her birthday. 
as if that was not disturbing enough, when the police showed him a pair of panties that they had found in the woods, it seemed like John became aroused by that. Sick, sick, sick. But once again, due to lack of clues or any evidence of what had happened to Rashonda, the case eventually went cold. Even though nobody could prove that John had killed his stepdaughter, many were now convinced he did. As a result, John's colleagues at the Department of Transportation expressed their reservations about working with him anymore. And so John was transferred to Sweet Home. Don't fire him, just transfer him to a different area so other people can deal with him. By this time, his marriage with Linda had already ended and he had moved in with his mother. In Sweet Home, John became a regular at a local spot called Sherry's. It's a 24-hour restaurant popular amongst the teens from Sweet Home in Lebanon. For John, it was like a hunting ground. Two teenagers, 17-year-old Melissa Saunders and 19-year-old Sheila Swanson had begun hanging out in Sherry's in February of 1992. They were very familiar with John. He would often offer rides to the girls at the restaurant and was referred to as perv due to his habit of hanging around teens much younger than him. Sometime in May, John overheard Melissa and Sheila talking about their plans to make a trip to the beach. A week before they were about to leave, John invited them and the other group members to a place in Newport. Apparently, John was planning to have a party. John don't have no friends, but he's going to have a party. However, you know, after him telling everybody about this party, very few people were interested in his offer. But Melissa and Sheila said they would come over. But in the end, that did not happen as the two did not show up to the camp on that Saturday. Instead, Melissa and Sheila arrived at Beverly Beach Campsite on May 3rd, where they met with Melissa's family. They had a lovely day swimming, spending time with each other and having dinner. But as soon as the night came, the two teenagers became, I guess, to feel bored. And so they decided to try to get a ride back home. Using a payphone, they called some of their friends, but nobody was able to come and get Melissa and Sheila. Then they thought hitchhiking was the next best option. After that... Nobody heard from them again. On Monday morning, Melissa's family woke up and realized she was not home. At first, they did not think too much of it. But then a few days later, Sheila's parents called them, saying their daughter had not been at home either. How many days needs to pass before they call on their teens that are missing? Still, it seems like this kind of behavior was not a new thing in either of the household, as it took the families 11 days to finally file a missing persons report. Even after that, the case did not move anywhere. The police seemed uninterested in the investigating the disappearance of the two teenagers. They're just assuming they ran away. They only interviewed a couple of friends and family, but no searches were ever conducted. Interestingly, John Ackroyd's name was mentioned here and there, but he was never interviewed. Five months later, on October 10th, 1992, two hunters were walking in the woods off Hayes Creek Road near Eddyville made a gruesome discovery. Human remains. They had found Melissa Saunders and Sheila Swanson's body. Sheila's ankles were bound with leggings. Her socks and sneakers were still on her feet. A used rivet was discovered near Sheila's body, which most likely had fallen out of her pocket as she was being killed. Melissa's body was nude and parts of her were missing due to animal activity. The medical examiner later said it was likely that the young woman were strangled, but it was impossible to say for sure due to the advanced 
state of decomposition in the animal activity that had happened. Finally, a proper investigation was launched. Following the teenager's last steps, the investigators learned that they most likely left the campsite at the crack of dawn simply because Sheila's family and friends were sure she had never hitchhiked at night due to her deathly fear of the dark. Then one witness came forward saying that he had seen two girls get picked up by an Ohio Department of Transportation truck at the junction of Highway 20. In addition, John Aykroyd's colleagues told the police that around that time that Melissa and Sheila disappeared, he had appeared at the workshop covered in blood. It was probably around 9.30, and I heard the door open, you know, and I go, who in the world is that, you know? Aykroyd, you've come in through the, and parked over next to our office in the bay. You started to walk over, to going through the area, and, and we noticed he had blood all over his hands and arms. And I go, what the heck happened to you? And he goes, oh, I ran into a deer and I just had to gut him out. John's colleagues kept asking where the carcass was, but John said he had thrown it into the brush. The encounter was bizarre, to say the least. But only after the remains were found did John's colleagues suspect he had something to do with the deaths of the two teenagers. To everybody's relief, by this time, Melissa and Sheila's bodies were found. John Aykroyd was already arrested. All this time, there had been a task force going through Kay Turner and Rashonda Pickles' cases. Jefferson County, Bill Hanlon, had been absolutely sure John Aykroyd was responsible for Kay's death and his stepdaughter's disappearance. He just needed to find the evidence to prove it. As they checked the facts of Kay's case, the investigators came across the name Roger Dale Back, John's alibi for the time of the murder. Roger. Roger, I think Beck. Friend of yours? Not really. He's a friend of friends of mine, but I didn't have nothing to do with it. And they got a guy that's admitting that he killed her, bragging about it. In fact, there's a grand jury went on Monday and Tuesday to see if they have enough evidence to get him. But if somebody admits that they killed somebody, that should be enough evidence right there. When Roger's family and friends were interviewed, they said that they had bragged about killing Kay Turner on multiple occasions. Apparently, Roger had even used it as a threat against his wife. And so the police talked to Pamela Rodriguez, Roger's ex-wife, who told them that she had lied to the investigators before about her ex-husband and John's movements on the morning of Kay's disappearance. The truth was that the two men had actually showed up at the house at around 9 or 10 a.m. covered in blood. Pamela had then burned Roger's clothes and provided him and John an alibi, all because she was afraid of her ex-husband that her ex-husband would have killed her at the time, that she would be next. Finally, a few weeks after Melissa and Sheila vanished, John Aykroyd was arrested in the killing of Kay Turner. It had taken 14 years, but now was booked into the Jefferson County Jail. John's trial began in late 1993, during which his defense maintained that he had actually seen a different jogger the day Kate disappeared, but he had been confused by the two. The prosecution was able to track down the other jogger, Jane Morris, who then testified that she had indeed seen John uh, in August of 1978. According to Jane, she had been cycling down Camp Sherwin when she came across John standing on the road. All of the sudden, he pulled out a gun and told Jane to stop. But instead, her being smart, she turned her bike and cycled away, now hearing gunshots pass her. Jane said she reported the incident, but nothing came of it. What is going on in this small town? The court also heard numerous tapes from interviews with John after Rashonda's disappearance. In the recording, he gives conflicting information about the day he found Kay's remains. 
the jury also heard results of new forensic testing, which had revealed that Kay had been shot and stabbed after being sexually assaulted. The verdict is in. After just four hours of deliberations, a jury tonight has reached its decision in the trial of John Arthur Aykroyd. The jury found Aykroyd guilty on all counts, two counts of aggravated murder and three counts of murder. Aykroyd was convicted this evening of killing Kay Jean Turner as Turner was jogging on Christmas Eve in Camp Sherman almost 15 years ago. Roger Beck was also found guilty of the murder of Kay Turner at a separate trial. Still, as neither men ever confessed, we, do, we don't know exactly what happened to Kay that day, as we do not know what happened to 13-year-old Rashonda Pickle. When John was asked about her in prison, he said, quote, I am totally innocent, and I'll say that until the day I die. And I really believe he will because he's a creep. Nevertheless, in 2013, the Lynn County District Attorney took Rashonda's case to grand jurors. They did not have a body and no physical evidence, but they wanted to make sure John Aykroyd would never have the possibility to get out of prison. On October 4th, 2013, John entered a no contest plea and refused to reveal the whereabouts of Rashonda's remains. Meanwhile, Detective Linda Snow and Ron Benson began looking into the deaths of Melissa and Sheila again. They went through all the evidence and interviewed all the witnesses, families, and friends again. In the end, Detective Snow and Benson were satisfied what they had gathered and thought they had a strong case to present to the grand jury. However, the Lincoln County DA declined to prosecute. They justified the decision on the grounds that John Aykroyd was already in prison for life and that the trial would be too expensive. And that was it. Case closed. Everyone knew who had taken the lives of Melissa and Sheila, but he would never be officially charged with their death. Many details in their case and location of Rashonda's body will remain a mystery forever because the only person who could answer that question is no longer alive. On December 30th, 2016 at 12 a.m., John Aykroyd was found unresponsive in his cell at the Oregon Department of Corrections. Soon after, he was pronounced dead. Heart disease had killed the man who hurt so many others during his lifetime. And I'm wondering if there's not more. Many believe John might have been responsible for many other deaths along Highway 20. But if that is the case, we will never know for sure. John Aykroyd's reign of terror has ended but his only surviving victim still lives with the scars he caused so long ago. After years of silence, Marlene Gabrielson now wants everyone to know her story. It's a chilling example of what can happen when a victim of this type of assault is not believed. Marlene tried to warn the police about John, but nobody listened. But I want to hear your guys' thoughts. Marlon, we don't normally, we do not name group victims. That's just a policy. I just want to have a discussion with you just about including your... My name? Yeah, Marlene Gabrielson. Yeah. Story. Marlene K. Gabrielson. I'm a new PR. I'm a strong woman. Let's leave a rainbow emoji in the comments for all the victims and their families. Thanks to all my channel members and my Patreons who continue to support me. Their names are on the screen. If you would like early access to new videos and decide the cases I cover next, you can do so by clicking the join button. Well, if you guys have made it to the end, you guys are rock stars and I love you to death. There are more true crime videos in my Crimey Stories playlist if you'd like to check them out. Stay safe, my loves, and remember as always, if you see something, say something. And I'll see you in my next one. Bye.